Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer on Webinar, From Inbound to Opportunity, How to Maximize Your Inbound Call Handling. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by DealerOn. For anyone who isn't familiar with DealerOn, well, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency best known for our amazing SEO, the best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the award-winning Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. Hey, when we got back from NADA, we were awarded the Driving Sales Dealer Satisfaction Award for the top-rated websites for an unprecedented sixth year in a row. And we also took home the AWA Award for Best Websites. Plus, FCA announced that we're now an approved vendor. Hey, big things are happening over here at Dealer on this year. We're still the only company in the industry that offers a money-back lead guarantee program. You want to know more? Yeah, you do. You can check us out at DealerOn.com. And for all you wine lovers out there, you might want to head for Napa Valley on May 21st through the 23rd. Why? Well, because DealerOn is sending Greg Gifford, a.k.a. The Beard, to speak at the Digital Marketing Strategies Conference. That's why it's a high-level executive planning event, and the sole focus is to assist dealers in their digital marketing strategies. Of course, Greg will be there showing off his new book, Local SEO, Signals You Can't Ignore, and believe me, it is awesome. So tell me, you do not want to miss it. If you can make it out to Napa, this is a trip well worth it. We have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have Bill Wittenmeyer as our presenter today. Bill Wittenmeyer is a partner of eLead One, the leading dealership software provider in today's automotive market. Bill has over 20 years of experience in the automotive space and currently oversees multiple divisions within the organization, including sales, marketing, OEM relationships, and large client accounts. Prior to joining eLead One, Bill spent several years in the automotive retail space holding various retail positions in operations management. Highly regarded as a dynamic and motivational speaker as well as an industry leader with non-traditional views, Wittenmeyer speaks at several prominent automotive forums each year and contributes to top news publications and television business shows that reach industry business leaders in the U.S. Bill can be reached at BillW at eLeadCRM.com. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, we're going to try to respond by email later today. And don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will also be emailed to you later today for your reference. Feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And guess what? Our good friends at eLead One, ooh, they're giving away a great prize on today's webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to win an iPad Pro. That's a $700 value, a tremendous prize. You have to be on the live broadcast to win it, though, so stay tuned. And who knows, you might be the one walking away with this awesome prize today. Also, at the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to get a short survey. Please fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from our audience. We want to hear what you have to say. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation, so please tag us in it. You can use hashtag DealerOnWebby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. You can also hit up Bill Wittenmeyer at BillyTheKidWitt. We look forward to seeing what you're saying. All right, everyone, let's get started. Let's learn how to maximize your inbound call handling. B-Dub, how are you, sir? It's so good to have you Here back on the are. show. Always so great to be invited on here. Thank you so very much. Okay, and just so I'm sure, you weren't telling me to lay down, right? You were telling the dogs? <laughs> no, yeah, my dogs get excited. You know, they, they're always, they're so excited about all the moist tidbits and morsels that they're going to get in something like that. So it's, I mean, they get crazy. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm excited too. So um, why don't you tell the audience all the kinds of wonderful things we're going to be learning about today. Good job, Bill. <laughs> Right on. Well, we still got more because I'm going to go for the triple trifecta on that today. I just want oh, you to know. Really? I'm so excited. Listen, at the end of the day, we all know how important calls are. It's extremely important. But today I want to talk about some of the objectives up front. We know with competition at all-time high, sales margins tightening more and more each month. And certainly as we look towards the future, inbound calls are going to be that much more crucial. You know, right? Most challenges for dealerships is bandwidth, you know, having the resources to effectively communicate in ways that today's consumer prefers. Uh, and for 80% of consumers, the preferred interaction happens on the phone. So make sure you have the right people, the tools in place, give the customers that VIP experience right from the start. 
today's objectives, kind of the things we're going to discuss, talking about changing the culture by impl implementing uh, call management practices into your business, uh, develop inbound strategies to handle calls effectively and build caller trust, create call processes, accountability, and measurements to scale up performance. And of course, we'll have a drawing for a giveaway, as Liliana mentioned, and then finally, maybe a little question and answer session. So yeah. those are kind of the things we want to look at. Hopefully, we'll get it done in a short period of time. You'll get a couple of freebies along the way, uh, and I'll give out a couple of other things along the way as well. Hopefully, you can implement no matter what you're doing, where you're at at any time. So let's talk about prioritizing inbound call management. The first thing is we all know consumers they're increasingly turning to cell phones for research and engagement, right? We know mobile search, click call technology is changing the landscape, auto sales. It's enabling customers and consumers to dial directly from Google, driving record numbers of phone calls to the dealership, and actually resulting in a sharp decline in incoming email leads. Now, we might not have noticed it, but we certainly know email leads aren't going up as much as the inbound phone calls are. Um, here's the thing. When people are calling into the dealership, some actually feel that they're just eliminating you from the list based on the experience you get. A recent call source research uh, report shows dealers are still ignoring some of the ringing phones, despite the fact that the majority, about 89%, report that inbound calls to their dealerships have increased. In fact, eMarketer reported that OEMs and dealers spent almost $9 billion, $8.71 billion on digital marketing alone in 2016, and more than 60% of those spend targets shoppers using mobile devices. E-Markets forecast calls for consistent double-digit growth in digital ad spend through 2020, where it's estimated to be over $14 billion. This huge spend means that both OEMs and dealers expect dealerships' phones to continue to ring and ring more. Yet when they do ring, often our staff isn't equipped with the skills needed to convert that call into a showroom or service opportunity, right? The last few years, we've built a lot of the dealership around the internet department and digital lead handling, and we haven't focused much on the call center side. Now, while the mass majority of the dealers we surveyed agreed that having a comprehensive process for handling inbound calls is important, only about 40% are confident that they have managing inbound calls effectively. And nearly a third of dealers believe they lose one in five sales calls to a competitor. So that's a lot. So now we start taking a look at, despite the uncertainty of all their call management process, nearly a third of dealer survey believe they convert 21 to 49% of inbound calls into appointments. Yet if we look at a call source research, it shows the average dealer typically only converts about eight. So look, maybe even take it in the middle like a Joe Verde and cut it in half. That's still somewhere between 10 and 20. It's a massive amount that's still out there. That means if we looked at that 8% out of every 100 qualified sales calls to a dealership receives, only eight appointments are set, real appointments. We all know there's a lot of fluff in some of those. A hard appointment's gonna be considered an actual time and a date, and typically within the next 72 hours. I'm gonna give you a quick freebie. If you're setting appointments that are beyond 72 hours, that is not a hard appointment, that's a soft appointment, it's too far out. It has to be something that's a little bit more immediate. Anyway, those four consumers probably come into the showroom on the 50% rule, and ultimately two will purchase a vehicle. If I look at that same study, it showed that over 80% of a dealership's inbound sales calls don't ultimately convert to a sale. So we could go through a lot of math on that, and I could tell you how much money that costs. You have to make and see what it costs for you inside of your dealership on your per gross. I can give you the NADA average, which is 2200 per NADA this year. Look, you may be higher, you may be lower. Whatever you think you're missing, it's probably double that. So just consider that when you go through that. Ileana, I know it feels early already, but do you realize it's time for a poll question? I'm so excited about our first poll question. Now, audience, you might already know the answer to this question. Maybe. I don't know. But let's see if you're paying attention. The average dealer typically converts what percentage of inbound calls to an appointment. Once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And for those of you who maybe have never been on a dealer on webinar before, I know there's a lot of new people out there. Please don't write it in to me, although I love when you write to me, but actually see if you can actually click on the radio button on your computer screen to send in your vote, all right? Um, but do use the questions feature to send me any of your comments or your questions, and I will save them for the Q&A session, which is coming up right after the presentation. All right, so now we got a lot of people voting. Oh, audience, you are on it today. Oh my gosh, so many people voting. I love this. So again, the average dealer typically converts what percentage of inbound calls 
to an appointment. That is the important part, to an appointment. All right, so once we get, well, we already have, a, almost everyone has voted audience. You are on it today. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Bill, if you're done taking a swig of water, I will close this poll and share the results with you. Ileana, lay down. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I knew it was me. All right, hold on. Let's see what the audience had to say today. Okay, so hey. some, some people weren't quite listening to the last couple slides that you did, so we're going to have to keep them on their toes. 18% of today's audience believe it's as high as 23%. The majority, 62% of today's audience, say it's only 8%. 4% of today's audience, who are you people, think that it's 74%. 74%? Of, of calls to a dealership converts to an appointment? I want to be at that dealership, yeah. 9% of today's audience say it's as high as 44%, and the remaining 7% of today's audience think it is 17%. So say it loud and proud so the people in the back can hear you, Bill. What is the correct answer to this? What The average the dealer majority, typically converts what percentage of inbound calls to an appointment? The majority always rules. According to Call Source, it's at 8% conversion on inbound calls at any average dealership. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it's only 8%. That is awful? Well, it could be 4%. <laughs> well, that I would be good. Awful, right? The great news is there's a huge opportunity, really, and when you look at it, how many different areas of our space do we have so much of an opportunity? And there really isn't a lot. We do such a good job in so many places. I actually look at it as a positive because we always have so many challenges and we know that our competition is always so strong. So this gives us an opportunity to oversee our competition in a huge area, right? Even if I doubled I'm only going up to 16% and I'm doing a great job compared to everybody else. But never compare yourself to every, anybody else. You should always compare yourself to the best and you should be the best. So let's talk about creating a structured sales process because that's really where the key is, right? Whether it's inbound phone leads and they flow through an internal BDC, whether you have them going to the sales floor or some other type of process, right? Top performing dealers have a process in place for the opening of the call building the value proposition during the call and, sex, and successful completion of the call. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to experiment on this. Not the first process you put in place is going to work. Don't get disappointed. I will tell you, years ago in a dealership that I was running, I thought the smartest thing in the world was to put a centralized red bat phone on the sales manager's desk. Every time it rang, the first salesperson to answer it was the one that got the lead. And then I felt double that if they were sitting there and they had to answer and go through their scripts on the phone in front of the sales manager, they'd do a better job. Everybody always do, does better when they're monitored. Here's what happened. First couple of days, the phone calls, it was like running of the bulls in Pablona in my dealership. 15 salespeople were running for the phone. Finally, somebody would grab it, and then they'd get on the phone and they'd be like, oh, oh, I'm Mr. Cusser, this is Bill. And it was a terrible experience. So whatever you might think is a great idea to begin with, after you put it into practice, make sure you go, you evaluate it. That's your first freebie. The first one you do may not be the best. So let's talk about greeting and qualification, right? This is going to sound silly, but the most important thing is to actually answer the phone. On a typical day in the dealership, missed calls, either due to high call volume, high foot traffic, simply not being open when the consumer calls up, it all adds up. If you don't already have a backstop in place, you should do so immediately to ensure you're providing immediate service to consumers to come to expect. Now, look, don't worry about that midnight to 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. in the morning time. Yes, there are going to be some calls in the dealerships. I guarantee you, you really don't want to worry about answering those calls at that time. So keep that in mind on a backstop. Next, make sure you get the customer contact and detail information. Actually put them into your CRM, whatever you're using. What's important? Name, email address, phone number. Try to get two email addresses and two phone numbers, but at least get a name, email, and a phone number that they're calling from or you can call back. Be sure to include accurate notes. I know you think you'll remember it later. Your brain's only so big, it can't store everything. You're going to get sidetracked on other things. It's really key. You don't have to put down full, long John, Stein, John Steinbeck novel notes, but just little keys that will trigger, blue, car, whatever, four-door, whatever they're looking at. Those are really critical. People love to feel important. There's nothing more that makes people to feel more important than either A, let them talk, B, 
remember what they said. So if you could come back and say, hey, Ileana, I remember you wanted to talk about a blue car because that was your favorite. It was your grandmother's color and you want a four-door for your kids. Those are the type of things that are going to stick to them. You've got to make the notes so you can go back and make that happen at the end of the day. Be sure to also offer up any switch vehicle if the inventory is not even on the lot. Or even if the vehicle is there, you should always be offering at least one or two switch vehicles immediately to any consumer. That could be a same new vehicle like with different model trim up or down, and then always a pre-owned where you can offer to save them several thousand dollars. Hey, if I could save you five or six thousand dollars on a similar vehicle, maybe with only a couple miles on it, would you be interested? Very simple things that you can use at any time to get people engaged. You always want to have that open out just in case either the inventory is not there or they have already priced themselves outside of the market. Stuker uh, will finally ask for the appointment, appointment. I know this is crazy that you actually have to do this, but I can't believe that we still have so many phone handling taking calls that fail to get the customer information, ask for the appointment, or don't even, as a salesperson, give the consumer their name. So make sure that it's all there. Stuker a few years back did a report where he called over 5,000 salespeople across the country. Less than 20% attempted to schedule an appointment. Less than 5% made any attempt to identify themselves and have the consumer write down their name so they know who to ask for when they arrived in the showroom. Here's the great part. Those same people that forgot to even tell them who they were to the consumer that called in are the same people on your showroom floor that are going to complain when they feel like they're getting skated when the customer comes in and doesn't ask for them. So keep that in mind. Hmm. There was also a recent J.D. Power study. Inbound calls to automotive dealerships, they found that 11% of phone calls yielded customer data. So that means only 11 out of 100 people we actually got any viable information from. The other 89 in market consumers, probably heading to a competitor to make the next purchase. Look, you can only follow up with what's been entered in the CRM and the information that you have in the first place. So look at the missed opportunities your dealership misses on a monthly basis, because the salesperson doesn't get the customer information pockets it, forgets it, et cetera. And it's really easy. Look at any reports that you have. If you're only showing 100 or 200 phone calls a month for an average dealership, you only talk about six, three phone calls a day, you're missing a ton. We all know that the phone rings probably that every hour. So that's some of the things to look at. Yeah, I'm going to give you a quick tip and a freebie. You should always designate either a receptionist or a team of inbound call handlers and then make sure you tie a spiff to log him into the CRM, right? And don't make it an additional spiff. This is a mistake I made when running a store. We should never pay people to do what their actual job is. Tie it to an existing bonus as a qualifier so that you can go back and look and see that, right? You all have a volume bonus. You always have a gross bonus or some type of myriad of those two. Make sure that it's a qualifier of logging that information, whether it's a specific amount, et cetera, in order to qualify for that bonus. Don't pay them a bonus just to do the job that's already there. That's really important. Next, talk about scripting and interaction, right? We all have scripts. It doesn't matter whether you're reading one or whether you're saying one. It's a repetitive greeting. It's the same thing you say to your friends all the time. It's the first opening you do in a phone call. Those are scripts. They may not be good ones, but you've developed a script. It's a repetitive thing that you're doing over and over again, and that at some point you felt like you got a good response. So make sure your phone handlers have strong scripts. And not only that, but they're trained to answer informational questions quickly, overcome objections, and it's in line with what your company's goals and structure and culture are. And look, it's not about memorizing the script, although I think it's important to know the script word for word, but at some point you have to start to modify it a little bit to meet your own character and your own quality, and that makes it authentic at that point. If you're only reading a script or you memorize it word for word, it's not going to come off authentic. And one of the biggest things people like is vulnerability and authenticness. So I always tell people stories of back in my childhood or what's going on in my life or challenges, and that opens up to authentic. We all have problems. I don't want you to do that on a script, but I want you to get the same type of idea of being authentic, adding in your own words to the script. Just don't lose the direction of where you're trying to go on that, right? So if you change the words too much, you may change the results, so be careful of that. Most salespeople, great face-to-face just not on the phone. And vice versa, we all have people inside the dealership that are awesome on the phone, but they couldn't close a spring-loaded door if they're face-to-face -face with a customer. <laughs> you know, they don't feel safe. You know, It's not a comfortable environment for them, whatever it is, the protection of the phone. So just keep that in mind. You'll want to make sure that you have a designated inbound team 
that can train on the process, the scripts, and get the best results. And by the way, here's another freebie. Using the reportings either in your call monitoring systems or in your CRM or in both, which I'm going to talk a little bit later, rotate the bottom two off the team every month. That gives an opportunity for somebody else to come in and shine. You never know what somebody can do until you see them do it. So I never believe in keeping everything the same. Rotate the bottom two performers off every month. Add two new people in. It'll give you an opportunity to measure out and also an opportunity for people to join the team that you didn't know before. I'm going to tell you, look, good salespeople in this business, we are built face-to-face -face action, right? I've said this a lot. Those salespeople we'd hire typically have a high A personality traits, right? We lean towards assertiveness, we're eager, we have a thirst for competition. This is all great things for our business. But we could also accept no that often comes with selling and move on to the next opportunity. We have that drive, we have that ambition. We thrive in the spotlight, we interact well with people face to face, and we enjoy that. But here's the problem. We also have very little patience. We got the patience of a gnat. If we see something shiny, we chase after it. We become distracted very quickly, right? And it's hard for that personality to still be required to make those numerous dials and attempts to get customers back on the phone and into the store. Additionally, we also lack that interaction and the skills that it takes to be successful in communicating 100% verbally. We incorporate so many other things into our communication room with customers face to face. So keep that in mind. In order for that salesperson that needs to be successful in the showroom floor, it doesn't always translate well over the phone or an email. So make sure that we're always looking at that when you're looking for the skill sets of the people that you want to put in there. I'm going to give you another freebie. I'm happy to give any scripts. You can reach out to me at the end of this or after either at Billy the Kid Wit or on my email that we'll provide later. Happy to give you any books of scripts. Won't solicit you anyway. Hopefully you can get some great moist tidbits out of that. They're going to help you increase your production on the phone and your results as you go forward. Now I want you to take a look and I want to see what it's like when we have an inbound service call because this is key when you hear a good one. This is Carla. Who does the place you're speaking with today? Yes, this is uh, How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. Awesome. How can I'm I just hoping to get my, I'm just hoping to get my truck with that because my socks are kind of squeaking and I just bought it last year, so like, they shouldn't really be squeaking every time like the truck like moves. Alrighty. Well, let's go ahead and see what we can do about that for you. And you've been with us before? Yes, I bought my truck from you. Well, thank you for coming back. We do appreciate your business. Let me go ahead and get you pulled up here. What is the phone number that you're listed in our system with, please? Okay, and are there any other concerns or services due at this time or needed? Nope. Good deal. Okay. One at the time, right? Mm hmm <laughs> I just got my oil change like last month. Good deal. Okay. So have you pulled up for a 2016 Tacoma? Yep. All right. Do you have an idea of where the vehicle is as far as mileage goes at this point? It's about 15.5. All righty. Let's see here. Okay, so I'll put you down for the uh, the shocks making that squeaky noise there for you. Are there any other concerns? You said no other concerns, so we'll go ahead and... Nope. Um, all right, I'm going to put you on a brief moment of silence. I'm going to check availability. I'll be right back on the line, okay? Okay. Okay, and thank you for holding. I do appreciate your patience. Now, uh, mm -hmm. do you plan to wait with the vehicle or drop it off? Um, It just depends on the time. If it's in the afternoon, I'm going to wait with it. Okay, but if it was a morning appointment, you'd have to drop it off? Yes. And the only thing is it's my only car, so I kind of have to do afternoon. Okay. Do you have a preferred service advisor that you would like me to schedule you with? No, I, I've never. I've only done the regular maintenance there, but I've never actually done anything else. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Okay. So I do have availability either tomorrow afternoon or Monday afternoon, whichever you'd prefer. Uh, I can do tomorrow afternoon. That would be easier. Okay. I have one right at 1 o'clock, and I have a 145 as well. Um, can I do the 145? You most certainly can. All right. And what is the best email address to send a confirmation for the appointment out to you? Uh, it should be the one listed. Okay. Just want to make sure I had the right one for you there. All right. So mm -hmm. just to recap, you are set for your 2016 Toyota Tacoma. I've made a note that the shocks are squeaking. I will take a look at that. This is Friday, April 21st at 145. They will assign you a service advisor when you arrive. Is there anything else at this time that I can assist you with? Um, do you know if this is going to be covered by my warranty or not? I don't. What they'll do is they'll take a look at the concern and they'll bear, they'll confirm with the warranty company the coverage for the issue, okay? Okay. All righty. Thank you, sir. You have a wonderful day, okay? 
So that was a two minute call. And at the end of the day, that was a fabulous presentation. That's a real call. Obviously, we beeped out customers' private information and the dealership. I can tell you it was a Toyota dealership. You probably got that uh, listing of what he had bought and the Toyota Tacoma that he had. But look, there were some really good elements in that. What's the chance that a service advisor would be in that same position to do that? And what is the chance that you have that same process set up inside of your store right now? Dealers have to look at those incoming service calls and they have to make sure that they're either handled by a BDC, internal, or a virtual third party at some place. It's a great place to start if you're going to build your own BDC because you're not risking those sales appointments. And look, we all know how sensitive we can be as salespeople when we're not getting those calls. Service, on the other hand, great place to get immediate results if you're going to build a BDC or if you're going to put that out to a virtual outside source call center for you. So look, most service advisors, they do an awesome job of upselling to consumers in the lane. But many possess the same characteristics and qualities I just talked about as a frontline salesperson. Even though if you ask most service advisors, they probably disagree because they feel their job is more of consultative and more an advisor that manages the customer's experience. They are actually exactly salespeople in the dealership. They just have the different place to get their leads because they're getting them out of the service lane every day. So keep those same behaviors in mind when you think about that. How much business generation is being done from the service lane? Probably not much. They're generally concentrating on what's in front of them. And remember, multitasking is just the equivalent of doing several things poorly and not actually doing one thing great. So I took a recent sampling of 120 dealerships in a 30-day period using our contact center for service calls and showed over a 70% of inbound service calls resulted in an appointment when the calls are answered, uh, answered and handled properly. The most important thing, and this is where some dealers falter, is that you have to have a live person answering the calls ultimately at the end. How are incoming service calls handled during peak periods at your store, right? The times that are during the morning, that's when most people are calling in, and the times in the evening, that's the second time most people are calling in. The problem is it's the exact same time when your service lane is either being dropped off with heavy traffic or they're all picking up their vehicle. And of course, servicizers, they're going to be with them, right? They're providing excellent customer service. They're doing the walk-arounds. They're doing the active delivery. So now we're leaving the inbound call opportunities to chance when they'll receive a call back, follow-up, Maybe they'll even quickly move on to a competitor. Who knows? Most people at this point don't have a lot of patience, and time is the most valuable thing that they have. So think about that. So I'm going to give you a couple of critical things here that I think you could do to improve service call handling performance. Number one, as I said earlier, create a service-dedicated inbound call team or outsource it to a specialized provider. Pure and simple. When you're starting out, most dealerships don't require a large team. If you're going to build it, it's only going to concentrate on service. It's an easy way to test the waters. And don't forget, the team will have success just by answering all the calls and giving a great opportunity like the one we just heard. A small team consisting of one or two people is a great starting point. Make sure they cover peak time periods in the morning and the afternoon, as well as normal business hours. You don't have to really worry about the extremes at this point, after hours or before. Once you have a chance to monitor that phone traffic, there's always the option to expand the team and cover the after hours or later if you want to expand. Number two, make sure the inbound call team has access to to the service CRM, online appointment scheduling tools, whether you're using an outside source, your CRM, your DMS. Make sure they're trained on that, et cetera. If possible, try not to limit customers to specific appointment times. You heard in that example, they gave a couple of the either or examples and then dialed it in based on the customer's feedback. But always make sure that the service link can handle the schedule's capacity. You certainly don't want to overbook as this only facilitates bad customer experiences. They want options, not obligations. So make sure they have that convenience. And look, some service departments are, are set up where you can overbook and they'll get the vehicle and they'll give them a loaner. Whatever your service center is set up as and what your culture, you want to go make sure that you bid into that. Number three, provide the inbound call team with specific word tracks and scripting that consumers can receive a consistent experience across every touch point and you achieve the goals that you set. And remember to keep it simple. We try to overcreate in our business because we are such creative people. I'm going to tell you to keep it simple all the time because that is where it's really at. You don't have to have long scripts. You don't have to have long, drawn-out conversations. What you want to do is have key points that you hit on consistently across and then let it turn into a conversational aspect. The more conversational aspect you have, the more trust and authenticity you're going to get from the consumer, and it's going to start the experience in a much better way. 
Also, make sure, number four, for those with an auto attendant on a store's phone system, make sure you include, and this is key, an option that specifically allows consumers to schedule their service appointment. It should literally say to schedule a service appointment, press XYZ, whatever it is for you. That process is designed to streamline appointment calls to the inbound call team, and it ensures that they don't get bogged down with other inquiries. Where's my car? What's the status? I got to talk to Bob. He's a technician in the back. I got his lunch because he forgot it at home. Whatever it is, you make sure you have that streamlined process. Alternately, with you, the live operator, make sure that you coach them. Ask those additional questions when they're answering the calls. Help clarify whether they need a service advisor or they're calling to set a service appointment. Same thing. So make sure the operator is well-versed in how to route those calls as well. I'm going to make sure that you have that ROI for outsourcing. Inbound service calls is huge and immediate. All the customer is looking for is usually information or to schedule an appointment. If they can get someone on the phone who can answer the questions and get it quickly handled, you're going to set more appointments. That's going to equal more ROs. What happens is that people stop taking the calls because they're also delivering. It's too late. They don't want to take another one, right? Why do dealership service departments close down at 6 o'clock? Because they've been used to doing that. Try calling into a dealership around 4 or 5 o'clock. Almost impossible to get a service advisor. Number one, they're too busy with the current customers that they have and their active delivery. Number two, they really don't want to set an appointment that day because they know that it's closing time. And they don't necessarily want to work any later. They've been there since 6 a.m., it's about time to head home. It's a difficult job. I certainly understand that. Might want to look at doing shifts because that's how you can certainly sell more time. Because I guarantee you, if you open up those lines and have somebody answering those calls from 5, 6, and 7 o'clock, there are still plenty of people who want to bring their vehicle in after work. You'd be amazed how much more additional work that's out there. Outsourcing also gives you the ability to handle the information on scheduling calls with the ability to give warm transfers back to the receptionist or cashier for any other type of inquiry, whether it's status, et cetera. We can also get a better information, immediate logging, update existing records, and give feedback to the dealership. So there's a lot of critical things that you can do there. Even those four steps right now, you can literally go out and build a service BDC instantaneously with one or two people. Ileana, you're not going to believe this. It's Down. a whole question time again. How are you? Did I wake you up from the nap? You're doing great, Bill. Oh, my gosh. You are throwing out so many truth bombs. People are, are writing in saying how good it is. <laughs> it is really good today. Uh, you are on it today, Bill. So thank you so much. Take a break and, and take some water. And let me talk to the audience. Audience, we have our second poll question on the screen now. We're ready for you. We want to know what items, excuse me, what is the most important item you should out inbound call handlers have handy during calls. Okay, so we want to know which is the one thing that you definitely need to have when you get an inbound call. Please select one of the following answers. Do you believe that inbound call handlers should have smartphones to look up answers to tough questions? Discount offers to sway callers who object? Scripts and resources to answer questions and handle objections. Do you believe they should have nothing and they should keep their desks empty so that they can focus strictly on the call? Or do you think they should have a piece of paper so that they, they can write down names and notes of each of the callers so that they can later transfer it into the CRM? Once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. So, audience, we're testing you now. What item should inbound call handlers have handy during those all-important inbound calls? Please select one of the following. And also, if you have a question for today's Dealer On presenter, Bill Wittenmeyer, we are ready for you. We're going to be getting to the Q&A session in very short order, and we would love to help you maximize your inbound call handling. Bill still has a lot more information to go over, so strap in, everyone. It's going to be a nice ride, all right? Um, uh, almost everyone has voted. Audience, you are on it today. Thank you so much. What items should inbound call handlers have handy during calls? Well, Bill, if you're ready, we're going to find out what the audience had to say. I'm ready. Let's do this. All right. Let's see what the audience had to say. Only two out of the five answers were actually used. The majority, 73% of today's audience, believe they should have scripts and resources to answer questions and handle objections. The remaining 27% thought it would be a good idea to have a piece of paper to write down names and notes of each of the callers so that they can later put it into the CRM. 
So, I don't know. Is, is one of these answers the correct answer? You know what? One of the answers would be the focus correct answer, but I think both are awesome because I think you should always have a piece of paper to write down names and notes. I'm a big believer in that in post-it notes and then getting into CRM. Mm -hmm. However, majority rules again, the one we're looking for, scripts and resources to answer questions and handle objections. That's the huge part because I can't write down pieces of paper of information if I don't have a good script to get it out of them in the first place. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, scripts and resources. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me it was the chicken or the egg. I didn't know the answer to that. Okay, audience, thank you so much today for your responses to the poll questions. They really do certainly help us out, certainly bring us a lot of insight into what's happening in your dealership as well. Now, remember, we're going to be getting to the Q&A session kind of quick-like, so get those questions in so we can help you with your inbound call handling. Bill, back to you. I know you have some more great information to pass along. Let's talk about customer expectations, right, versus the customer's experience. This is, this is a huge part when we talk about inbound calls and we talk about their call experience or even outbound calls. There's a perception versus reality. You know, we know that most callers usually have done their research. In fact, we can pretty much guarantee at this point most callers have done a tremendous amount of research. I'm not going to bore you with any more statistics. We all have been to the different seminars. We've heard Google. We've heard everybody else. The number of hours that they're online, the number of different resources and 26 touch points that they're looking at, the number of video hours that they're looking at. They've done a ton of research. But be sure that the branding messaging that you're portraying online for your dealership is consistent with the experience the customer is going to receive across inbound channels. What do I mean? You know, when I look at most businesses, and, and particularly in our automotive retail space, sometimes the message portrayed or what we as dealers represent to consumers is not always reality. And, and we think it is, but it's also the same reality that every other dealer is given. For example, consumers expect they're going to get information specifically related to their search or they need for an operator or speak to somebody that can help. When in actuality, they're barraged with a bunch of questions because that's what we've taught them is to ask a bunch of questions to the customer as soon as they call, specifically informational about themselves, not the other way around, which is what they were led to believe. In the end, they most likely will get deferred to another person. They'll have to get back to them, to get transferred to someone else or multiple someones to find the information they're looking for. Here's another freebie. What I want you to always do, and this is good in life as it is in our business, you should always be a giver of information, right? You're not going to try to close a deal in the first two minutes of a conversation, and more likely than not, you're not going to close the car sale on the phone. You still have to do that in some other manner. So be a giver of information. Be willing to give information. Maybe an answer to the phone that way. What information can I give you? Instantly go and give them a different experience and a memorable one and portray what you really want to do, right? The challenge is that we often don't deliver on our message, which breeds mistrust, lack of transparency. Of course, those are massive buzzwords and action words in modern consumers in our industry right now. I mean, I'll tell you a quick story. I recently told a dealer, and, and it was half joking, but I was really serious. He had a severely broken in-house phone process that they might be better off making the store's phone line permanently busy. At least the employees wouldn't have the ability to destroy so many business opportunities, right? And then the customers, they might just think, wow, there's something going on. There must be something really important there. They're busy versus the actual experience of long wait times, multiple wrong department transfers, and a complete lack of information and conversation. Maybe instead of considering the same with our online display or marketing, we should think more along the message of, hey, we're human too. We might make some mistakes, but we try not to, but we're always going to do the right thing. It might make me come into a place just to think about it. I want to give you a little thing here. Another freebie. Test your processes regularly at the store. I want you to call into your own store. This isn't just once a year. You need to do this on a monthly basis. Number one, you need to check to see if your numbers are still well. I can't tell you how many people have phone numbers that get disconnected, rerouted, or something happens to them by mistake, and the phone number they have advertised in their advertisements isn't actually getting through to the dealership. Number two, what is the actual experience that happens? I'm going to give you a real case scenario story. I'm going to leave out the dealership's name to protect the guilty. It was a BMW store in the Northeast. I called to talk to the general manager, uh, and he had asked me to call them. And I went through a minute and 35-second experience where, first, I called in. I was greeted by an auto attendant, which told me that the phone call would be recorded. No problem. I'm used to that. Then it transferred me to another auto attendant that told me the phone call will probably be recorded. Then it transferred me to a third auto attendant 
where I would be recorded. I finally, on the fourth one, got to an auto attendant where I could select something. I chose the operator because it never once, and again, this is the best of all of it, it never gave me a sales opportunity. It said press one for service, press two for parts, press three for the accounting department. Who's calling in for the accounting department on the <laughs> consumer line? Anyway, never gave me an opportunity for sales, and it took me a minute 35 with four transfers to get to a final person that I could actually talk to. That's a real case scenario. We think that it's a one-off. Trust me, it happens more than you can believe. So you should always test your processes from multiple numbers, multiple times during the month, and make sure you do it repeatedly, right? As dealers, we should always try to differentiate the business and ourselves, not in that way, but with worn out cliches that are acceptable to use if you're comfortable with them. Just make sure that your actions are in line with the message delivered, right? That alone may be enough to make you stand out. What I want you to do after that is I want you to concentrate on measurement and accountability. This is really important. How can we modify the experiences and outcomes of our clients? Simple. Measurement, accountability, cross-channel consistency. That's huge. As I mentioned earlier, every dealer should have a call tracking ability that's tied into his or her CRM and or DMS. And it needs to be specific to inbound calls and campaigns particularly. Can you do outbound? Absolutely. Highly recommend it. It's vital to review the actual number of incoming calls, those answered by your team, time spent on the reporting, right? We need to be able to look at the corresponding number and appointment schedule. This reporting enables you to monitor effectively, manage staff performance, and make needed adjustments. You can also gain insight into higher traffic times, other missed opportunities, and metrics that can provide great feedback or coaching points to maximize the team's performance and execution. And there's a plenty of a great different companies out there, certainly call box, call source, great ones. Make sure they look to have a strong, high interaction and integration with your existing CRM. The more times you ask people to log into the CRM, the less they're going to do. So a lot of these great products out there already have a tie-in, and it automatically will put that information in there. Just make sure you choose the right one that fits for you. And if you're not measuring, you definitely cannot improve. It's critical to have transparency into how many phone leads are received actual number of calls, not what we think, and what type of each lead was, right? We've got to look at the differentiation between sales, service, parts, etc. Who managed the opportunity, and of course, ultimately, what was the result? A dealership needs to use those tools, provide objective measures of each type of lead and the outcome based on the now speech call, right? You need to make sure you look at the call routing. When to use an auto attendant on the store's phone system, make sure to include clear category options, include sales, service, appointment scheduling, as I mentioned earlier. Want to look at convert, uh, conversation analyzation, right? Train inbound call handlers to effectively communicate and convert, this is important, customers to something, whether it's information or it's an appointment. Don't look to make sure you're converting it to a sale on the call. It's not happening. We need to focus on selling the appointment and getting information and giving information, as I said earlier. We want to make sure that. We've got to help specifically identify where the pain points and vulnerabilities in our team's phone skills are. Then we could do true coaching and counseling. The reality is today, most don't know what's happening on their phones. And if they do, they're not doing a whole lot about it, and that's hurting you. So you can change it and turn drive conversion sales and profits to develop a culture that understands every call that comes in is important develop a structure, transparency, accountability, and consistency, incoming call process. Here's a couple of things. You need to prioritize and track marketing efforts, understand the actual source of the call, not where you thought it was coming from. And most of these great companies that I mentioned will enable you to create those sourcing based on different numbers. I always uh, tell people to do A-B testing too. Make sure you've got them in the different things you can compare one campaign, for, uh, one campaign versus another. Evaluate which leads are new and which are real sales leads, right? What's a new opportunity? What's a B-back, et cetera? More importantly, take the time to listen to the conversations and use the results as coaching opportunities for unprofessional exchanges, not setting an appointment or getting a customer information. I can tell you the best people on the phone can always find something else that we can tweak a little bit more and make the call that much better. And obviously, the ones that are lesser on the phone, you've got that much more to work with. Let's look at it as a positive and an opportunity to get better. Create and measure key behaviors crucial to setting the appointment and entering the CRM that you can use to coach based on the employee skills gaps, right? Quantify the progress each has made. Set realistic goals and make sure you continue to elevate that bar. So I'm going to give you a couple of different things on this. Look at the number of different calls, opportunities you're missing per day, per week, right? 
I have always said you cannot manage people. You can only manage their activities. So focus on the activities. The biggest thing we want to look at is appointment ratios. How many incoming calls are for service versus sales? What are our appointment ratios based on that? Make sure you append phone lead records. Simple contact details. You can append an assortment of data variables so you really have an understanding of who your potential customer is, what they're interested in, best way to target them. Make sure that if you set up a BDC, an internal, or team, here's a couple of things that I think you should do, a couple of freebies, right? You want to develop a pay structure that's contingency bonuses, set performance goals, align with incentives. Here's a couple of examples. Number one, offer above average pay. If you pay average hourly rates, you're going to expect to get average and hourly talent. I had somebody tell me yesterday, oh, I can get any bozo to interview somebody for a company. And I said, well, if you get bozos to interview people for your company, you're only going to get bozos in your company. So think about who you hire, what you hire, and the average pay. If you're paying the same as McDonald's down the street, nothing wrong with anybody who works at McDonald's. Is that the type of person that you want to give the actual expectations and experience to your consumers? You're going to have to start above average pay. Next, set performance goals and align incentives. The goals your dealership has for its BDC or internal team it should be established and clearly understood. What's the call routing? What's the survey completion number that I'm looking for? Average call length, what should we be targeting? CRM login consistency, and then make sure the pay plan needs to be in sent to those goals and judged as most crucial of dealership. Third, keep directions simple and concise. I said this earlier, I'm gonna say it again. Employees who don't understand the incentive or how to achieve it, they're gonna lose belief and focus and they're gonna to fail to accomplish the goal or they're gonna believe that they can't be achieved. Don't overcomplicate the qualifiers or the scoring methodology for the incentives and call reviews. Keep it simple on those simple targets or benchmarks. Next, change things up. You gotta keep monthly goals and bonuses fresh. Most people get into a routine, which is just a rut that's been extended, and if you keep things the same too long, that's exactly what happens. So reward different skill sets by changing the goals every month. This gives BDC agents more opportunities to succeed, works in their areas of deficiency, and it keeps people engaged. They always think they have a chance to win, and they do, and that's reality. Finally, measure the performance, provide feedback. Feedback is one of the most crucial things we can get anywhere in our life, whether it's in business, whether it's personal, and most of us are afraid of it because sometimes it's not what we wanna hear. But give positive feedback quickly and negative feedback quickly. Whatever it is, don't hold on to it. It's not gonna change, it's not gonna go away. But make sure you give it quickly. It's crucial to measure every day the important BDC activities that your dealership manages. Provide those reps with feedback on success, coach them on items that need improvement, and make sure that you do it quickly because that's a huge thing. I'm gonna give you a last freebie on this as well. I love to throw out daily specials. Doesn't have to be every day, it could be weekly. Just make it for that one day. For example, maybe it's the best call that was handled by an agent that day and change it up. You know, you could do four of those a month. It gives everybody an opportunity and it can increase the opportunity that day and maybe even the performance of those people as they go along. Now, let's look at a couple of last things. We take a look at inbound marketing benchmarks. If you are building that BDC or if you have one or if you're gonna create one or even if you've got one that's on the outside and you're using a virtual one, I wanna give you some benchmarks to look at as we start to finish up. You wanna have the uh, increase the ability to do a hybrid. If you currently have a BDC, it's a great idea to use an outside source to do that heavy lifting for you because there's a lot of numbers that need to be dialed. We're gonna take a look at that. An outsourced BDC can do that heavy lifting, pass the information back on to you where you can have that customer do that internal personal touch when you reach back out. I hear all the time from every dealer that I go to, they say we have a unique customer or a unique customer base. It's not true guys. They all, they all want the exact same thing ultimately. Your customers all still want the same result and the same information. They may want it in a different way, they may wear something different, but at the end of the day, there is nothing unique. It is all the same. Outsourcing gives you the ability to handle that informational scheduling calls, the ability to give warm transfers back to receptionists or cashier for service type calls, right? You'll get better customer information, immediate logging, update, et cetera. I wanna start talking a little bit about some of these outbound stats that you hear, right? No one ever says they did a bad job to their boss. This, I can guarantee you not many of you went up to somebody and said, yeah, when, he, when, your, when your boss said, hey, what happened to Billy Joe Bob? You never went up to him and said, man, I blew that deal awful. <laughs> you said, oh, he, we're still in good contact. He's still thinking about it, et cetera, right? This is where third-party feedback comes in so importantly. And I think you need to either adjust that as your BDC to approach it from a survey basis, or if you outsource it, it becomes even that's more critical, right? I'm gonna give you a quick brief story and we'll wrap up with a couple of other benchmarks. 
years ago when I first started flying all around, it's been 15 years. I've got a lot of miles. I'm very fortunate that Delta treats me as well as they do. I buy the cheapest ticket, but they always put me up in first class. Most of you, if you know me, or if you've seen me outside of my suits, I'm pretty ragged. I wear shorts, t-shirts, tattoos, nothing like what anybody's best. I get on a plane. I like to travel comfortably. I walk up. Two things happen to me when I start to head to first class. Number one, they usually ask me for my ticket to make sure that I'm supposed to be up there. Number two, when I sit down in the seat next to somebody, for variable usually 10 to 15 years older than I am, they look at me and they always ask me the same question, which is, what do you do? Years ago, I used to make the worst, worst mistake I could do. I said, I'm in the car business. For the next four hours from Atlanta to Seattle, it'd be free advice that I'd be giving. They'd be asking me about what's the greatest rebate, what's the best car out there. They'd tell me about the worst experience they ever had, about a trade-in, how they got screwed by a dealer. What do you Literally tell them now? four hours. Do you make up something? Do you tell them you work in Hollywood? Well, what back do you say? then, Ileana, I used to come back and I'd say, instead of I'm in the car business, I'd say I'm in the insurance business. Can I sell you some life insurance? And they immediately shut up. And it was <laughs> peace and quiet for four hours. Now I just put on the Bose headphones. You can tune out the world and people know you just don't want to be mad with. So anyway, my whole point to that story is people love to talk about the car business. They just don't necessarily want to talk about it with us as dealers. They're afraid that we're always after something, whether it's money or we're going to get an advantage of them. Keep that in mind when you're talking about scripts or how you're approaching the call, etc. It's always great to call on behalf of your dealership, not from your dealership. That's another quick freebie. If you're calling on behalf, it sounds more as an informational or survey based. They're much more likely to open up. So let's talk about a couple of those benchmarks as we wrap up. You want to look at how to handle those incoming calls, right? The average time it takes a dealership to answer, and this is based on a survey that we did over 5,000 dealers. The average time it takes a dealership to answer a call is 52 seconds compared to a virtual contact center is 14%. That's a 73% increase. Outsourcing can actually reduce the average call handle time by as much as 40%. Customer in, uh, information conversion rate, 97%. They'll actually give you the information if you ask for it. That means that 90% of the people on the phone that we got on the phone will actually gather and give you updated info points on them. Current email, phone numbers, vehicle mileage, et cetera. The industry average call to appointment ratio is about 8% as we talked earlier. In recent dealership survey, we're finding lists up to 30 to 50% for call to sales appointments. And with service, you heard me talk about earlier, it's over 70% on service appointments. We're seeing an average increase on ROs of over 26%. But keep these last things in mind when you talk about doing your own BDC. We know after making 59 million live calls last year, you have to keep this in mind if you're going to do it. It's a good thing but it's gonna take you on average four attempts per customer to get them on the phone. You're gonna need at least one phone number with those four attempts to get 67% contact ratio. And finally, if you get two phone numbers, you can move that to an 84% contact ratio of actually getting the right person on the phone at the time. It's a lot of numbers to think about. It's a lot of information to think about. As I mentioned earlier, happy to give out as many scripts as possible. I've got two great slides left. I always do this in every presentation I do, and I always like to jack around with people that come into my office. You ever seen these motivational posters? This isn't one of them, but I like to trick people because if you have a motivational poster in your office, and I don't mean to offend you, you're already dead. If you've got to have a poster that gets you going every day, you are not hooked up to the world. So, mediocrity. Just because we accept you as you are doesn't mean we've abandoned the hope you'll improve. So I love to see people's faces when they say, oh, you've got these, and then I know what kind of person I've got. Finally, insignificance. If you think it's lonely at the top, just wait till you try the bottom, baby. So think about it as you go forward. I hope you all take a little freebie, do something, improve. Whatever you do in the quality of your life, time is the most important thing. Be thankful of the people around you and the opportunities that you have. Be gracious and always look to pay it forward. Really appreciate having you all on today. A couple of suggested resources you can see in the deck uh, through the call source report that I mentioned earlier, as well as the eMarket Auto Industry Digital Ad. And don't leave out with the action items. Prioritize those call management, business, culture. Develop a company goals that achieve all the CRM tracking measurement. Make sure you implement accountability. Coach those processes. It's a lost art. Coaching, counseling. Managers should be the greatest coaches and counselors of all. Ensure that customer experience is consistent with your customer's expectations. 
and of course Ileana. At some point, we could find an expert, and they could ask questions. In the meantime, they can ask me. <laughs> Bill, that was an amazing presentation, sir. Thank you so much. All right, audience. Only for you. Oh, I thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, you know what? You can turn on your webcam whenever you feel like, sir. Audience. It's my turn to talk to you. A couple things I want to point out to you. Yes, send in your questions. We're going to be getting to those questions in just a moment. We have some really good ones for you, Bill. So drink some water. You're going to be doing a lot more talking in a little bit. All right. Um, I do want to uh, direct everyone's attention over to the handouts section of the GoToWebinar interface. In that handout section, you will be able to download not one, but two really great handouts. First handout is going to be a copy of Bill's slide deck that you just had the opportunity to see. So you can download that now until the very end of this broadcast. Now the second one, Bill, you're going to have to help me out here because I took a look at it and it is awesome. The second handout is called the Phone Skills Guide and it's got something like 36 pages in it. It is really oh, an yeah. incredible we'll, we'll resource. What? I said, we'll overwhelm you. Yeah, I know. It, it has so much good information. If you do nothing else today, download that handout, my friends. That is gold in there. It's got scripts. It's got uh, rebuttals. I mean, so much great information in there. So it's called the Phone Skills Guide. Again, it's available in the handout section right now for immediate download up until the very end of this broadcast. I'm not going to mince words. Download it like now. All right, here we go. Bill, are you ready to give away a really cool prize? Hey, right on. Oh, I'm so I've excited. Pro, right? <laughs> well, hold on. It's that time, audience. If you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, I announced that our good friends over at eLead One are giving away a really cool prize today. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to win an iPad Pro. This bad boy is worth like $700. It is so awesome, and I'm not able to win it. But one of you is, so I'm really excited for you. Tremendous prize. So what I need you to do is get ready, get to your keyboards, get those fingers nice and ready. Hopefully you took wonderful notes. First person to write in the correct response to our giveaway question is going to be winning this awesome prize today. Now, audience, if you are a vendor, we love having you here. You're always welcome on a dealer on webinar, of course, but we're going to ask you to kindly sit this one out. This prize is intended for dealership personnel only, but you know, have fun. All right, here we go. Good luck, everyone. This is not an easy question. No, the answer is not 80%. <laughs> <laughs> I the love answer it. Is the answer is moist. The answer is moist. No, it's not. I love how people are trying to guess the answer to this. No, you would have had to been paying attention. You would have had to take some notes on this. All right? Here we go. Good luck, everyone. Earlier in the presentation, Bill was talking about consumer expectations versus the consumer experience. What Three things did he say are needed to modify the experiences of customers. Three things. And it's a little difficult because he put two on one slide and the other one he kind of mentioned. So hopefully you caught all three of them. <laughs> I just want you to know not one person has answered. He did say all three of them. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a good to get prize. A free iPad Pro, you got to be dialed in. <laughs> you got to be good about it. Okay, let's see. Mm, mm, nope. Nope. Uh, oh, 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 man, so close. One of you is so close, but you didn't get one right. You got two out of three. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. Uh, um. Nope. Oh, oh, that's so close. Oh, man, so close. Oh, people are getting two, but not the third one. That's oh. so funny. Oh, it's so close. Okay, audience, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read you your answers, but they're not right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully one of you guys will get it because this is a really cool prize and I definitely want to make sure somebody deserving is going to get this. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, uh, where do I download from? You go to the handouts section of the GoToWebinar interface. So look on the GoToWebinar interface and look for the word handouts and then click on the little triangle next to it. It'll open up and in there you'll see both handouts ready for immediate download. Okay. Okay. Um, one person said, I guess I didn't pay enough attention. 
<laughs> the next person said, greeting, qualify, two phone numbers, emails, ask for the appointment. <laughs> said all those things. That would be true. That's true, but that's not the answer we're looking for. Okay, authenticity, scripts, track calls, intelligent call routing, conversion analysis, let them talk, remember what they said, and take notes. No one knows, note-taking, no competence. Okay, um, none of these are right, by the way, audience, so keep going. Um, word tracks, training and coaching, live person, conversational fast to the right person, give information, test process, get info on the phone, giver of info, measurement and accountability, and measure oh. performance. Oh. oh, so close. That's too that out of three. That is really close, Crystal. Listen, acknowledge, give them your name, authenticity, transparency, live person, scripts, answer time, positive attitude, testing, measure and accountability. Oh. My, that's close too. That's two out of three. That's so close. Information gathering, take notes in the CRM, answer questions, ask for appointment, get contact info, answers, they want answers, test your processes monthly. Yes, mm -hmm. all true. That's all true. Um, G check and see if numbers are working. Question number True. two, good information, relevant, be giver. Okay, so no one, um, actually this one's not so bad. This one's measurement, accountability, and benchmarks. Oh, so close. man, that's, oh, you so know. Close. That's, two that's, out of three, I know. I know. And, and the third one was change the words, change the result, but the result's the same, so it's not bad. Yeah, um, so I don't know what I should do about this, my friend. You've got three that are close. Three that are close. Uh, did any of them mention moist? Uh, yeah, actually, one of them did. <laughs> there's your winner. <laughs> Come on. You're there's lying. Your <laughs> nope, there's your winner. Congratulations. Uh, okay, hold on. Measurement accountability designated in BDC. Measurement and benchmarking marks, pay plans, CRM entries, development. And da, 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 da. Oh, my God. We have to give away this prize. Um, shoot. I'm, I, I think I should just give it to the first person who got two out of three because I'm not I'm seeing okay somebody with, with the third one. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to give it to the first person who got two out of the three. So... Um, what three things are needed to modify the experiences of customers? We were looking for measurement, accountability, and cross-channel consistency was the third one we were looking for. So unfortunately, no one got that third one, which was consistently consistency. I blame, I blame the actual orator or the presenter for that. I mean, I, it's fault. totally his fault. I take responsibility. So. <laughs> All right, so the first person who had... Uh, measurement and accountability was Crystal Fuller. Crystal Fuller, I'm giving you the prize. Congratulations, right Crystal nice Fuller. Job. Good notes. Crystal Fuller, you are the winner of a very, very cool prize. You're going to be winning that iPad Pro. It's going to be sent to you by our good friends over at eLead One. Crystal, congratulations. This was a hard-fought win. I need you to send me the name of your dealership and, of course, a mailing address so that they can mail out this prize to you as quickly as possible. Audience, thank you so much for playing along. I know we only had one great prize, but we had to give it to somebody, and she was the one that was the closest. I didn't see anyone that, that said um, uh, consistency. So... Remember that now. Measurement, accountability, and cross-channel consistency is what we were looking for. Crystal hasn't sent us the name of her dealership yet. Hopefully, it'll come across soon. But everyone else, I want to talk to you now. We give away cool prizes every single week. So come on back to another Dealer on Webinar. And who knows, that could be the day you win a cool prize on Dealer on Webinar for right now. Crystal Fuller is our winner today. We want to say congratulations to her. And thank all of you for playing along. And, of course, thank our good friends over at eLead One for their incredible generosity. By the way, Crystal Fuller is with Team Toyota in Sherrerville, Sher Indiana. Oh, my gosh, I have no idea how to say that. <laughs> I'm sure I butchered that. But, hey, you're yeah, winner today, Crystal. The Caterpillar plant. <laughs> Oh, she said I was close. I no See, idea. I'm not so bad after all. All right, Crystal, congratulations. You're going to be getting that prize directly from our good friends over at Elite One. All right, Bill, we have some wonderful questions that came in. Are you ready for this? Yeah, sure. Okay, I, I want to start with one of, uh, not one of the first questions that I got, and I don't usually do that, but I want to make sure we have the right information that's going out there. So um, I want to start with um, this one from Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, 
are the marketing benchmarks blended numbers of sales and service. So if you remember on that slide, it had the, the big circles are across the bottom and you gave these sure. great benchmarks. So he wanted to know, is that just for sales or is that just for service or is that a blended thing? That, that's a great question. Uh, so for Jeremiah, what my answer would be is that it's really, it's blended across both uh, when you look at that. Certainly you can look at them separately. You'll have different metrics uh, on the service end. We know that if you ask those questions specifically, as I mentioned, um, you know, either by the auto attendant or the actual um, receptionist, if you streamline that process and, and dial it down, you can get even better metrics such as uh, are you calling for a service appointment specifically? Uh, that will change some of those metrics a little bit, but that's that's an overall blended across the board, assuming that they're not doing something that's that specific and dialed down. Okay, Jeremiah, thank you so much for the great question. I actually love that question. So uh, you got another one? Bring it on. Here we go, Bill. Next question. Actually, this one was the first question that came across, and his name is David, and David says, Please don't mention my dealership name. We have, you know, I don't want any rumors starting about firing people or anything. Um, but questions about outsourcing calls versus having in-house receptionists. Are you seeing dealerships move 100% of receptionist type roles to service providers? And have you found that to have better results? My early research on that is we can spend less time training in-house and they 100% of the time enter the information into the CRM with some mm -hmm. services offering text transcripts as well, which I thought was also great. Yeah. So again, this is from David. Uh, so my answer to that, David, is a great question. Um, you, first, I would, I, I'm going to make the assumption that when you say receptionist, you're actually talking about the frontline receptionist that would take all the inbound calls for the dealership in the traditional setting that they would usually be out front. They're also a greeter and, and various other things, as opposed to a receptionist that would be considered a BDC agent somewhere that's working out of a BDC. So given, given that, I've, I've seen a small section of dealerships uh, that have outsourced the receptionist. My answer to that is I, I think you can get some consistency with that. I think you can certainly get um, some good quality information uh, on that uh, because they're trained to a specific set. But here's my challenge that I would pose back to dealerships, which is this. Receptionists are the most important people that you have in the store. They're typically the lowest paid, but they talk to more people than anyone else at the dealership on any given day, on any given week, and any given month. And yet, what do we do? I'll tell you what I did as a general manager. I made a lot of mistakes. I'd look at the receptionist. Maybe she wasn't answering a call for a couple of 20 minutes or so. We start to make them multitask. We give them ROs to sort out. We give them all these other tasks to do. I had them licking stamps to send mail out. Look, most important job that a reception has in your dealership is that first experience for the consumer that's calling in. What I did after I learned a very valuable lesson is instead of trying to outsource it or do any of these other things, I focused my receptionist on one thing, and that was selling cars, believe it or not. And her job or his job at that time was to take the inbound call, get quality information before passing it on, and then passing it on to the right place. Next, what I did is I tied my receptionist into the sale of every vehicle that happened inside the dealership. It's small, but I, I gave her a buck for every car we sold. We sold about 450 cars a month, new and used. So that was a $450 raise instantly. But what it ended up doing, and look, that's not a lot of money, trust me, to, to the dealership and to, and to most of the people that are still out there and hanging in here. I mean, it, you spend more money on mystery meat on a Saturday to keep the salespeople there uh, so they don't go out to lunch. But what it does to a receptionist, it's either on an hourly basis, et cetera, is it ties them into the whole process. My thought process was I wanted everybody that was crucial to the customer's experience to be dialed directly in and always be thinking about, oh, this is selling a car. What ended up happening is he and she and all the receptionists that I had, they would start getting involved. If there was a customer that was walking around the showroom that hadn't been greeted or was, was out there and people hadn't been around them, they'd immediately get involved and be like, hey, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do? They really started to learn more and they became experts. So 
may not answer your question. I think that it's out there. It's certainly a viable resource. You know you're going to get a consistency with it. You know you're going to have a monitoring with it. You know you'll be able to fire them at any time when they're outsourced and not have any HR issues or any of those things. So I think those are some positives. But I think some of the upside is if we took our own receptionists and made them that much better, you wouldn't need to go outside. And not only that, you'd have a much better experience at the end of the day for your consumers and the dealership. That was a great answer. David, thank you so much for that great question. And if you have a follow-up question, well, we'd love to get to it. So please make sure you send that question. But I hope that that gave you some great insight. And we wish you the best of luck at your dealership, sir. Okay, next question, Bill. You're on a roll. Okay, uh, again from Jeremiah, by the way. Jeremiah wrote in, how should staff handle customers who call with the expectation of speaking with a technician? Mm. Well, I think that's a great question because um, most technicians, um, great people, not great on the phone. Uh, in fact, they're not great face to face, which is typically why most of them are in back at their racks and there's a big sign that says, due to insurance reasons, uh, please do not come back here, right? I mean, that's the way most dealership service bays are set up. Um, I think what's a great idea, and, and I did this in my own store years ago, and, I've, and I stole it from somebody else. I, I haven't come up with anything original. It's great ideas I've seen from other people. Um, I actually had one designated technician because, trust me, there is somebody inside of your store uh, that's a technician that is awesome verbally. There always is. They're very technical. They're very analytical. I found one, and they always want to improve themselves. I found one where I paid a little bit extra money that was my go-to phone technician, so I didn't have to try to route and find somebody. He had a bat phone that was at his desk. If we really needed somebody, he was the technician go-to. He may not be able to answer the exact specific on that customer's exact car at that moment, mm -hmm. but he had enough technical knowledge being a tech that he could have a great conversation with them. The customer felt like they got what they needed, or he could get the information and get back to them. So my answer is, A, you're not going to get, and most technicians are not going to want to be on the phone, and you're not going to want them on the phone. There is a solution now. There is somebody there that wants to get better. They want to increase themselves. They ultimately want to be a shop foreman or whatever it is in their dreams in their life. Provide them with that opportunity and say, hey, I want you to be my go-to person. You or he or she, you're going to be the one that's going to be our technical advisor if anybody calls in. The number of calls for that is probably going to be significantly low overall compared to the amount of other volume that's coming in the store, but you would be amazed at what that kind of experience is for a consumer and nobody else is doing it. I guarantee there isn't another shop or any dealership that's around you that's doing it so you'd be setting yourself apart. And you could even advertise that, hey, you can call one of our technicians anytime. It's, they may have the perception they're going to get any of them, but no, you have your go-to technician for yeah, Honda, Toyota, whatever your manufacturer is. Hope that helps and you can improve that. Uh, Jeremiah actually wrote back and he says, great ideas. Thank you so much. All right, Jeremiah, thank you so much for that. Okay, next question comes in from Shelly. Uh, this, <laughs> this might be a whole nother, this might be for your next webinar, by the way, an another All idea. Right. So Shelly says, what are your best tips for setting an appointment on an inbound call? You know, I I could probably get, you're right. I could probably go on for an hour. You already know how long winded I am. I, I'm I, I think really some of those cool. tips are in that in that handout that we have. Though. It, it is. There's some scripts in there on that. I'll, I'll give you a couple of other things that aren't in there because I think the scripts will help significantly. And and using any script is going to help. And again, as I mentioned, kind of uh, in our webinar today, it's not about memorizing it word for word. It's really about you know knowing it so well that it becomes conversational to you. So I think that's important. I think I think the other thing is, uh, of course, ask. Number one, you have to ask for the appointment. So many people don't. Um, I've always lived by the 300% rule, which uh, was a was an old Ryan uh, F and I insurance school back in the day in Chicago, which will date me a little bit before JM and A. Um, <laughs> And it was 300% rule, which is ask 100% of the people, 100% of the questions, 100% of the time. So if you do the 300% rule, you're going to immediately increase your results. So ask for the appointment. Just don't ask for it too early. I think you have to earn that right. How do you earn that right? Authenticity be vulnerable, and be a giver of information. You know, I love starting off the call with how can I give you information today? What information can I give you? Hey, I'm Bill, what information can I give you in your shopping process? Right. There's a lot of different ways you can set that up that kind of lowers the defense of the consumer that's calling in. I think what I would remind people is, 
customers more often than not have a better script calling into a dealership than the dealership has in rebutting the customer. What I mean by that is this, they're calling through a list of dealerships. It could be three, four, or five. We know they're only gonna show up to one, maybe 1 1.6, depending on who you believe today. But it's less than two dealerships they're actually gonna physically go to versus five or six even five years ago. What they're doing right now, as I mentioned in the webinars, they're eliminating you along the way, right? They're saying, well, that experience sucked. Well, I'm not gonna go there. So I think it's really crucial and really key to give them that experience when they call in about being information, about being giving. You know, if you're that hard to deal with over the phone, the immediate thing that the consumer's gonna think is, geez, they're going to be even worse when I get there. They're off the list. So make it authentic. Uh, do the experience that you're looking for. Always ask for the question. And I think you have to give before you can get, right? And w in our business, too often, what do we do? We immediately go towards trying to get, 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 right? We ask questions. What's your name? What's your number? What's the best number I can get you back at if we get disconnected? Ah, come on, man. You know, look, I, I think that's kind of old school. I think there's better ways to do that. I think it's okay to be authentic, which is, look, what's the best way for me to get a hold of you? What's your preference? You know, how many times do we actually ask customers, how do you want to be spoken to? Right. And we don't. We assume. So, you know, you might even get back that they want to be text. You know, certainly as the next generation comes around, they're not going to want to talk on the phone or email. They're going to want to text you with emojis and everything else and a smiley face. We'll take the whole Sharpie to a new well, level. I mean, I think some mobile. customers, you know, love text, but they don't know that text is an option for a lot of businesses. Right. You know, and I hesitate to, to even tell dealerships, hey, you'll text them if that text doesn't actually wind up in the CRM. I think it's well, important and, to make and sure it, it it's does. Well, and it's compliant, right? I could do a whole other thing on compliancy and the fact that all these people are doing text already from their phones, but it's not compliant. You're not getting an opt-in. There's not a record. But anyway, Shelly, long-winded. I told you it would be. I'll cut it. I think you have to have the right greeting. I think you have the right opening to it. I think you have to be a giver of information before you start trying to get information. You always have to ask for the appointment because that's the biggest thing that we find people don't do. And look, it's okay to ask more than once and ask for the preference that they want to be communicated with early in the process. So I think those are the things that I would do. You'll see appointment ratios go up immediately on that. It's more important to have them uh, set an appointment and give them the information, in my own opinion, than mm -hmm. it is to even have 20 different pieces of information from them. Um, they'll ultimately give you that information because they're looking to get something from you. Right. Okay, so Shelly wrote in, great reminders. Thank you again. And we did have a follow-up question that came in from Daryl. He says, tell me again, what was that 300 rule? Oh, the 300% rule. Um, so you want to ask 100% of the people, 100% of the opportunities, questions, or whatever, 100% of the time. So, you know, we related in F&I that every single person came in, we were going to offer them every single product that we had every single time. Um, if it's in sales, I'm going to make sure that I go over every single feature of the vehicle with every single person 100% of the time. If I'm on the phone, I'm going to 100% get information and give information. I'm going to ask for an appointment 100% of the time, and I'm going to do that to 100% of the people that call in. So you can apply that 300% rule to really just about anything. Okay, there you go, Daryl. I hope that helped you out. Okay, we do still have a lot of questions that came in. So Let's try and power through them, Bill, okay? Let's try and keep your yep. answers a little bit shorter, all right? All right, now, ah. Ah, now next question comes in from Kathleen. Kathleen says, do you know of any reports that are a good source for this information within eLeads? Which ones are best to measure this? There are so many, and they read so differently. Yeah, and, and that's a great question because, um, you, you know, every dealer has a different way of measuring something. I'll give you, I'll give you an answer as I answer your, your question backwards. They, they give you different information that may seem the same because some dealers consider an opportunity to be multiple, right? Every, every opportunity is a be back, it's the first show, it's a call in all tied to the same customer. That would be three opportunities to that one customer. Other dealers consider an opportunity to be that individual customer only, right? So that's where you could get a huge variance on, on how people look at it. I think a couple of great reports, depending on if you're using a telephony uh, call monitoring uh, system, as I mentioned, it's tied into eLead, either a call box um, or a call source is certainly in any of those statistics. Uh, your VBDC report, your BDC, and your salesperson's performance reports would be the ones that I would go to first. Okay, Kathleen, I hope that information helps you out. You certainly asked the right question, on, right person, the, that question on that. Okay, um, if you have a follow-up question. We're here for you. Ah, Kathleen says thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kathleen. Okay, next question comes in from Lewis. 
And Lewis says, what is the best method for handling online leads? Do you believe it's phone calling the best, email, or text? Well, you know, I, that, that goes back down to, I'll answer this in two parts. I think it goes back down to how does the consumer want to be communicated with? We make the assumption, right? We make the assumption as dealers, and we have for a long time, that because they emailed me in, they must want to have me email me back. And that's not necessarily the case. And what we end up doing is we end up making what I call email internet love, right? We go back and forth and, oh, we're the greatest dealership. We're family owned. We're going to give you great experience. And this just exchange of internet email love making goes back and forth. We really don't accomplish anything. Is that what the consumer wants? I don't know. We never asked. Um, my own personal opinion, I always try to get them on the phone if they provided a phone number. And look, I know based upon our years and, and hundreds of thousands of leads each year and, and month, in fact, from every manufacturer, every part of the country, 72% of all internet leads have a valid phone number on them. And that's without you requiring it, right? You know, if you require stuff, they just don't fill out the lead submission form. So I already know that three quarters of the people provide a phone number. That gives me the assumption they want to be called. I want to get them on the phone. I want to talk to them. Um, at the end of the day, it's quicker. Um, a lot of things can be lost in translation when it comes to email. And listen, my phone call to them, if I don't get them or if I do, may start off with, hey, I got your internet lead request. I got your information. I want to be a giver of information. The first thing I want to do, Mr. Consumer and Mrs. Consumer, I want to find out how you want to receive it back. Is it okay that if I'm on the phone with you right now, is that faster? Is there a better time for me to call you? Would you prefer a text or would you rather have me email? And I do it in that order, right? Because the email is the last one that I want to have. I want to give them the opportunity to be on the phone with me right now. I already told them I'd be an information giver. If that doesn't work, is there a better time later? So I gave them an either or. And then finally, I hit them with the text. If they bail on those, uh, two with the third option, then I go to the email, which is my last one. Okay. Lewis, I hope that helped you out. Great question. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Next question comes in from Kelly. She wants to know how to get your phone scripts. <laughs> Easy. Um, I think uh, we can either provide them or you can reach out to me at, at Billy the Kid Wit on Twitter or um, at my email address there, uh, Bill W at eleadcrm.com. Happy, uh, happy to provide those. Again, no solicitation. I couldn't close a spring-loaded door anyway, so we'll get you those scripts and hopefully it'll help out. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let's see. Question coming in from Joel. Joel says, when you speak about setting performance goals with incentives, are you referring to inbound calls or outbound? And what would you recommend from a sales and service perspective? Well, I, I think you could do all of the above. I, and I think what you do is you focus on what first, where is your, your biggest need? You know, that's the one that you want to focus on first. Um, whether it's sales, whether it's service, is it inbound, is it outbound, right? There gives you four. That may give you four months worth of incentives right off the bat. As I said earlier, you want to change it around. You don't want to be in that 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 routine, which is a rut that's extended. So, you know, you could do all four and you could start with the one that has your biggest need. If you're doing okay in service and they've got it pretty well backed up, maybe that's my last one. If I need to work on sales, um, maybe it's taking the inbound calls first, then I move to outbound, and then I move to service inbound and outbound on service generation, right? I do it in whatever order my need is. Um, and then I continuously change it up. And I think it's important to look at, you know, if you're talking about inbound calls, obviously the result is what is my appointment and information. Those are the two things I want to focus on to begin with. If I don't have information, I can't follow up. If I don't have an appointment, I got nothing. So right. those are the two things that I'd focus on and go back and forth. In terms of outbound calls, I think you look at duration, uh, number of calls per day, how long were they on the phone for, right? A good CRM should be able to measure this internally. If you're not hooked up, that's okay. You can get it or at least do it manually. You know, if they're only on the phone for an average of 45 seconds, what are they doing? They're just leaving a bunch of voicemails that's not doing you any good so then that allows you to go in and coach and counsel and see what numbers are they calling right are they calling a lot of home numbers and they're calling them during the day well guess what most consumers are at work so now I need to change my process out on the showroom floor and I need to find out how do I get more cell phone numbers why am I getting so many uh, home numbers when I know I can't get them there so there's a lot of different ways that you could spin off on that just by those four incentives and learn how to coach and counsel and find out what's really going on Okay. Um, I did. I'm sorry. I apologize. Joel, I did leave off a piece of his question. Uh, um, I know, right? Um, when it comes to uh, service performance goals, 
is there a way to also set up ones for service retention and equity mining? Yeah, absolutely, Joel. That's a great question. So I, I would incorporate that in my outbound calls of, uh, of service. In fact, specifically, that's what it would be. I really wouldn't want to tie anything else in the service on outbound calls because really what's left, you start talking about status updates, et cetera, and, and, and that should be automated anyway. But you, know, you talk about data mining and you talk about uh, appointment confirmation and you talk about uh, people that haven't been in service for the last 90, 120, even longer, right? So I'd go after those three first. Those are great incentive ones. In fact, you really want to test somebody or an outside source, you know, give them a list of, of customers that used to do service with you and hadn't been back in six months. Right. I guarantee you that if they get a percentage of those back, the dealership can't claim it. At the end of the day, that outside source did it or your BDC did it, and that's a great way to test it because you do it in the 90 days, 120 days. Yes, that's good business. Yes, it's quality. Yes, you need to do it. But a lot of service directors, no, no negativity intended, are going to come back and say, oh, they were coming in anyway. So I like to really test it, you know, if you're going to go that route. Go the 120 beyond, you know, go six months and, and do some campaigns either internally or externally on that. Um, you know, look for people that hadn't been in for a specific time. Uh, your CRM or database mining tool or, or both should be able to look up who's due for a certain service in a specific time that hasn't been in. Uh, those are great data mining things, and those are great things to put forth. Uh, in that time period, if you establish an internal service BDC, when the inbound calls are a little bit less, right? I'd switch over and make it a hybrid and blended. So, you know, that, that kind of like two, that one o'clock to two o'clock time and kind of that 10 to 11 o'clock time is typical when we see the inbound service calls drop off. They get higher at lunch. But those two times you can make outbound phone calls and really generate and make something happen. I love it. Joel, we wish you the best of luck on that. Oh, and Joel wrote in, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All yeah, right. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate you being on. All right, last three questions, and then we will wrap this up, all right? Daniel wrote in, I was listening to the call recordings we have now, and I am completely in shock with how many callers were being sent to hold please or yeah. voicemails. Yeah. Truth, right, Daniel? Thank you so much for that. <laughs> okay. I actually, no, no offense to the wonderful call monitoring companies that are out there, and I, and I mentioned several of them uh, that are great partners with us, and there's a bunch of them that are out there. But I used to joke that um, they should hand out a bottle of Mylanta with their contract because the first 30 days, it'll make your stomach upset when you start listening to some of that stuff. <laughs> Well, there you have it. That's yeah. good marketing right there. Okay, let's see. We got one in from Jeremy. He says, what are some of the best things to say to talk someone into purchasing a warranty? We sell warranties ourselves as sales consultants, and it's important that we sell it. You got any magic words of advice for Jeremy you and know others what? like him? I do, actually, and, and I hope Jeremy doesn't take this uh, inappropriately. It's coming from a good place, and Jeremy, by the way, one of the name of my favorite songs in my favorite band, Pearl Jam, so I already like him right now. But I will tell you that, um, and, and I was in F&I for a long time, and so I guess it's not caught too far off guard, this question, but here's the first thing I would do. I said in my uh, presentation earlier, I said change the words, change the result. The first thing you need to do, and you probably didn't mean it this way, but you said talk a customer into. And see, the, when I heard that, it struck me as you don't believe it. So the first thing, any good product, you have to believe in it. Uh, if you don't believe in it, you, you're not going to talk anybody into anything, and you damn sure aren't going to sell them anything. So I'm sure you didn't mean it that way, but I want you to think about what is your perception of the product Am I just trying to hit a number and a goal, or do I really believe in it? And if I don't believe in it, I need to investigate it more, I need to research it more, and I need to find out and find some good examples of people that have benefited uh, significantly from it. Well, what, I'm a huge what, believer you, in it. What would you say other than talk someone into it? <laughs> you mean sell it to well, them? Or? I, I, look, I think as a consultant, I think we, we would do people an injustice uh, for not giving them the opportunity to save money in the long run. We know consumers keep vehicles for a significant period of time. We know that the real majority of the problems that are going to happen in a car are not mechanical. And look, the majority of the car now, I mean, it, it was as true 10 years ago as it is today. You know, cars are so much more complicated with so much computer systems. And I mean, it's more powerful than my iPhone and my Mac and everything else combined, the amount of computer systems that are in there. And look, go open the hood on any car. You can't work on it. I mean, it's built so it's locked down. You can't even do basic maintenance on it. It's very difficult. The manufacturers don't want you in it because they're so complicated. I think what I look at is I want to serve that customer 
a, a justice by the fact that I know if they are going to keep it for a long time, look, there are things that are going to break. How often do you change out your computer, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how I get a new Apple computer every two years, either it burns out, blows up, or, you know, it gets outdated. And I think the same thing happens with all the electronic systems that are inside a vehicle. And that's me if I was back in retail. I, I wouldn't talk to anybody in anything. I want to sell them. I want to be a good advisor. I want to do the right thing by them. Uh, I always believe in that. Uh, and I certainly believe in the product because I know ultimately something is going to go wrong on that. And if it's electronic, which it's a high probability that it's going to be, or computer, it's going to cost a lot of money. So mm -hmm. um, that was a long-winded answer. And again, I know Jeremy didn't mean it that way. It's just when, when, you, when you say it that way, that's the first thing that I think of. And if I think of that, that means it might be possible that you don't believe in it and you're just hitting a number. So go believe in it. And if you don't believe in it, find something you do believe in. Well, he did write back. He says, oh, I believe in it. I have one of the Good. highest penetration percentages at awesome. the dealership, but every bit of advice helps. So thank you yep, so much. Every little piece. Every little piece. Um, I think it's a great example. You know, we, you know, there's a lost art, Jeremy, in um, uh, in the proof book, right? The proof of concept book. There's all different words. We called it years and years ago before the magic of computers and internet and people walked into our stores with consumer reports under their arm, right? We had this giant book that we had of all of our customers and our references. And I think you could still do the same thing today and you can do it in electronic format and create your own folder of, of people that had great experiences. You've got a high penetration of warranty and you've probably got a high penetration of people that have had a good experience where, hey man, this saved me a lot of money. They'll be happy to say something. They're thankful for it. You know, put it down, put it in your little proof book and make that into an electronic version. I bet you nobody's doing that. Hmm. All right, Jeremy, thank you so much for that great question. All right. Last one comes in from Kendra. She says, sorry if this was already answered, but with inbound sales calls that get filtered through a receptionist, would you recommend those go to a BDC who handles all other leads, or should they be paged to a sales consultant? Mm, well, I guess it depends on the um, on the actual store and the culture. At first, I hate paging inside of dealerships. It's super annoying, and, and, and it becomes background noise, and I think consumers are annoyed by that. Um, there are better ways and technology to do that. I won't waste your time on this. I think this, number one, if you have a BDC currently, then I think it's important that the calls immediately get routed to them. I would use an auto attendant or my actual receptionist. Of, are you looking for sales information, right? Or do you have a specific salesperson? Very simple. Um, and then depending on what that is, I go to the salesperson or right back into the BDC. I don't want them to have a lot of time or interaction uh, or wait time. I, I like to route it directly there. Um, if I'm going to a salesperson, I saw a great process years ago that still holds true today, which is you create your own little inbound team and it's basically the, the next three people uh, are, are waiting for that phone call. Um, and the receptionist takes the phone call, gets a phone number, marks it on uh, an actual sheet. I know this sounds archaic. You could do it in the CRM as well. well Kendra they wrote in, it's a very old school dealership, so she wants to know what your opinion is uh, on this. There you go. So. Look, <laughs> cool little green sheets is what they were called and it basically had the operator's name it had the salesperson's name it had the time of the phone call and the phone number which are all very accessible by the receptionist she or he would write down her name or his name they put down the customer's name they put down the salesperson they gave the call to because they were next in line they had just a rotating sheet that sheet then had to be grabbed by the salesperson they take the phone call that's the only way they knew what line the number was on, like it would have, okay, it's on line three. So the, none of this got paged. You have to be right there. They get it. They go. They answer the call. And then everybody had a tracking of this. And then the top part was at the end when they were done with that green sheet, they had to turn it into the sales manager to get signed off. Then it went back to the receptionist. Receptionist put it in. So that's really archaic. It may be too much process, but you could modify that if you're kind of an old school dealership. It works awesome. Okay. Kendra, thank you so much for your kind question. Last one came in from Rob. He says, hey, Bill, do you have a book for sale? <laughs> <laughs> Rob must have been in one of my time movies. for you to Rob's write up the great American novel. <laughs> I, I think Rob is, is jacking with you. I think he's been in one of my seminars before, and he's heard me talk about I was terrible at retail, uh, which means <laughs> that's why I'm a vendor now. And then, you know, the next step in a vendor's life is they write a book about it, which maybe I'll do someday. But no, I, I don't have any books. Most of it probably wouldn't be worthwhile, and half of it I probably couldn't write in there anyway. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. 
<laughs> you certainly speak like an expert, Bill Wittenmeyer. It's a pleasure to have you on here. You laid out so many great points, big truth bombs, and so much amazing information. I, I, I can't thank you enough. We had so many wonderful people on here today who think the same. Um, by the way, Kendra wrote in, thank you, I'm the only BDC and used e-lead and deal with all internet leads and I'm the only one really using the CRM and I'm just trying to figure out how to better track all of the dealership traffic. So thank you for your information today. Yeah, thank Bill, you for your support. Thank you for your information today, sir. Right <laughs> you rocked that one today. So thank you so much. Hopefully it won't be too long before I get you back on the show, sir. Thank you so much. Yep, glad to be here. Thank you so very much. Always a pleasure. All right, fantastic presentation. I want to remind the audience a link to download a copy of today's webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today for your reference. Feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. It was awesome. And today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. All you have to do is go to dealeron.com slash webinars to view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars too. Yeah, and at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey. It is three short questions, three. So fill it out. We are always looking for quality feedback from our audience, and we want to know what you thought of today's presentation. And, yes, for all you wine lovers out there, you might want to head to Napa Valley May 21st to the 23rd because DealerOn is sending Greg Gifford, the beard, to speak at the Digital Marketing Strategies Conference. It's a high-level executive planning event, and the sole focus is to assist dealers in their digital marketing strategies. And yeah, Greg's going to be there showing off his new book, Local SEO, Signals You Can't Ignore. It is over 60 pages of awesome. You don't want to miss it, all right? And invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next DealerOn webinar. And it's a doozy. How to use video during downtime to increase sales. YouTube and Facebook can easily be major income producers for car salespeople. If done right, salespeople could earn double-digit increases in car sales simply by posting unique videos on those two popular social media sites. However, most folks don't utilize one or both correctly or even at all, or they make boring videos not worth watching. Do you want to know how you can make videos in your downtime that will bring you lots more money? We're going to dedicate a full hour to show you in detail how rock star car salesman Mike the Louisville Chevy dude Davenport does just that. He should know he's a top performing sales guy with over 4 million views on YouTube and 40 thousand followers on social media. Mike is going to share his video tips, tricks, secrets, and strategies. Attendees of this incredible one-hour presentation will learn how any salesperson can take the power of YouTube and Facebook and turn it into a marketing empire for themselves and their dealership. This is the game changer that you have been waiting for. If you already or if you're ready to learn how to use video during downtime to increase sales, then this is an hour of automotive awesomeness you can't afford to miss. So register now. Don't forget, Dealeron's weekly webinars are held Thursday at 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding our webinars and our topics, I'd love to hear from you. Track me down. I'm everywhere online. I'm on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, you name it. I'm on all the auto automotive social networks. Or you know what? You can just email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. Thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today. And I hope to see you all on another webinar in our continuing education series. Take care, everyone.